Hello and welcome to this uh, devotion from Amelia Plantation Chapel from my office. I'm just really pleased that we can try this. It certainly is an experiment because we've never done it before, but during this time of the COVID-19, we're going to try to record uh, some devotions for you, and we're going to try to do it on Wednesday. I'm very blessed to have with me uh, Terry, who's going to share with us some music on his acoustical guitar, and also Kayla, who is who is filming this. And so let's begin uh, the day with prayer this Wednesday after Easter. Let's pray. Glorious risen Lord, even on this Wednesday, following Easter, you are acquainted with our darkness and fear. For you've been there. Yet even now you would enter the darkness and gloom of our tombs, our tombs of fear and doubt, real or imagined, that separate us from you with a light that needs no other source but you. Jesus, with the mercy that the only one who has been there can grant, illuminate, we pray, the tombs in which we have fallen or in which we cower. May the gentle and embracing dawn of your resurrection stir us from our slumber and reveal the light of a new day when all of creation will be renewed by your word. Indeed, the, the tomb in which you were placed is empty now and forevermore. Amen. share with you today the Gospel of Mark's version of the resurrection, and I'm going to read from Mark 16, uh, verses 1 through 7. My friends, let us hear and listen for the Word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as I have told you. The word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. The nursery, the nursery through third grade children had all gathered in our fellowship hall while the junior and the senior high students began placing plastic Easter eggs all around the church's campus. We were only about 45 minutes from, from opening the doors for the mad scramble. The Nursery school had had a few bad experiences, and so they had roped off their, their section and, and guarded it while all the families were coming in. As we waited for everyone to gather, we had music and, and games to keep all the children occupied and away from the doors. It was then that our youthful volunteer, the, the one that we asked to be in charge that year, asked several of the adults if they were aware of the of the wonderful change she had made to our Easter egg hunt that year. And, and yes, though those words brought the immediate uh, query, change? What change? <laughs> Whereupon she uh, informed us of the, of the gross over-commercialization of, of Christmas and, and Easter, in her opinion, 
And therefore, rather than put candy into the Easter eggs, she copied pertinent scriptures concerning the resurrection and placed them in the eggs. <laughs> One of the adults asked, hopefully, you mean you included them with, with the candy, right? <laughs> no such luck. <laughs> Looking into the eyes of nearly 50 children and their parents, we went into a panic crisis mode. One very wise elder made a quick trip to the grocery store, bought up every plastic egg he could, he could find, along with the bags and bags of miniature candy and, and jelly beans. It was a team effort, let me tell you. But with less than 30 minutes to go, we packed new plastic eggs and refilled some of the old ones just around the, the front of the door with, with candy and scripture. See, the problem was, many of the children were so young, they, they couldn't even read. And those who could read, well, I have to tell you, they weren't impressed when they found an egg with a small slip of paper on it. They didn't even take the time to, to notice that it was Scripture. In fact, many of the Scripture quotations found their way into the, the warm uh, summer breeze of the day, spring breeze. And, and I'm telling you, it was a pastor's nightmare because the word of the Lord was hitting the ground again and again that day. <laughs> it's an Easter that I'll, I'll never forget, especially a, an Easter egg hunt. I read once in the St. Luke's Journal of Theology something by Harry Pritchard. He tells the story of a young, young boy named Philip. I would imagine some of you have heard the story of Philip before. Philip was born with several serious medical conditions, as well as Down syndrome. Philip's parents were regular church attendees, and at their church, Philip was known as a, as a loving and a delightful child. He was loved by everyone. Until about the third or fourth grade, when a few of his classmates maybe even Philip himself, became aware of, of their differences. One Easter, the teacher of Philip's class managed to collect several of those uh, larger plastic eggs in which certain uh, brands of ladies' hosiery came, used to come in. And she handed one to every one of her students in, in the class, and she instructed them that Saturday to, to go out into the churchyard and, and find something uh, on that beautiful day that could represent new life, the new life that we have in Jesus, our Lord. It was kind of like the mass Easter egg uh, scramble that I just described in, in reverse as the students began to scurry all over the churchyard looking for something to represent new life. And when they returned to the classroom, they, they piled their huge plastic eggs on a table. And the teacher began to open them one at a time. One had a, a flower in it. Another, a, a butterfly that floated across the room to several oohs and ahs. <laughs> one little boy put a, a rock in his and justified it by saying that he just wanted to be different from everybody else, putting in silly flowers or butterflies. But the last egg that the teacher opened was empty. There was nothing in it. Some of the students began to laugh, and, and others protested, saying somebody didn't do their job. They didn't listen to the teacher. But at that moment, Philip tugged on the teacher's dress and said, It's my egg. It's my egg. Immediately, some of the students began to uh, badger Philip, saying, Philip, you never do anything right. But Philip said, no, no, I, I did get it right. I got it right. The egg is empty. The egg is empty. Just like the tomb. Just like the tomb. Jesus isn't there anymore. It's empty. Like my egg. The room full of fourth graders became amazingly silent. And I believe as, as the
the author put it, Pritchard put it, at that point a precious miracle occurred. Because from that day forward, the class was somewhat different. Philip was much more accepted and appreciated by his classmates. Pritchard writes, if, if only the story ended there. But being a true story, it didn't end the way that anyone desired. Later that year, in the first very severe storm of winter, Philip's other uh, medical complications flared up. An, in an infection in ensued, I believe, in Philip's chest. And Philip entered a coma from which he, he never recovered. Everyone was devastated in the, in the church family. And at Philip's funeral, the most amazing thing occurred because nine eight-year-olds, accompanied by their teacher, came forward to Philip's casket to place on it, not flowers, but empty plastic eggs, a symbol to them of Peter, of Philip's new life, of Philip's new life. My friends, it's empty. This is what we celebrate even today on this Wednesday following Easter. This is what I hope we celebrate every day of our lives. The fact that the tomb of Jesus Christ is empty. Christ is alive. In these days in which we live, there is many things that cause great anxiety. The coronavirus the economy, social separation. But our good news is in Christ. Indeed, the tomb is empty. But our hope and our salvation is in Him. He is alive. So let us, like Philip, celebrate the empty tomb. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Would you play another song for us, Terry? Thank you.